so excited and grateful to see uh, this full house of people who love science as much as I do. So as Mark said, this is Brainstorm 2019. It's our second annual Brainstorm 2019. And as you heard Mark say, I'm Miriam Good. I'm the director of the foundation and really just feel that I have the best job in the world. I'd love to give money to scientists. So some of you are new and you may not know that Mind Science was founded by Tom Slick in 1958. And you may also know him as the founder of Texas Biomedical Institute, Research Institute, and Southwest Research Institute. So we were founded and created by Tom to explore what he called the vast potential of the human mind. And how we have worked toward that end has varied through the years, but we've always sought to improve the health and well-being of humankind. That's been the through line through all of these years these, since 1958. So our purpose in presenting the competition is, is multiple. We want to fund high quality, impactful research that leads to meaningful improvements in the well-being of humankind. We want to invest in early career researchers, much as a venture capitalist would. We want to get in on the ground floor of something exciting and something that has great promise. And we want to encourage these researchers to learn how to explain their science in language that you and I can understand. I don't have a science background, so when a scientist explains their work to me and I understand it, they've done a great job. So we do have, and here's my long list of thank yous, we have our wonderful silver sponsors, the Brown Foundation, the William Knox Holt Foundation, our bronze sponsors, the Muriel F. Siebert Foundation and the Smothers Foundation, and additional underwriting from Joan Cheever and Dennis Quinn, Kena Forguson, Frost Bank, Helen K. Groves, Bob and Joan Carabin, and Gil Robinson. And if you are a trustee of Mind Science, would you wave your hand so we can thank you as well? Thank you. And we had wonderful volunteers tonight from the Cubers of tech, the Texas Speed Cubing. So I hope you all got a lesson tonight. And we have wonderful, dedicated staff and volunteers. So thank you, sponsors, trustees, volunteers, and staff. We <clears throat> would not be able to do this without your support. We also have a special guest tonight, mm -hmm. Subu Sankara Subramanian, last year's winner, will come up at the end and give us a little update on her work. I'm looking forward to that. And so a little bit about the contest and the competition. Each one of these projects went through a rigorous scientific review uh, with both an internal scientific uh, committee of the Mind Science Foundation and by external peer review. So what we're presenting you with tonight, all things being equal, these were all equally worthy scientifically rigorous projects. And just by being here tonight, each one of the finalists has already won a $15,000 research project. So I have had an upfront seat to the hard work and dedication that has gone on for over six months. So you're gonna be really uh, pleased at what you see and hear. Um, so when they're done, with their pitch presentations, then I will come back up and we will get to vote and I'll give you instructions then. But for now, please welcome back to the stage our amazing, amazing, and here he is, Mark Mitten. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So now it's time to start the contest. We have three contest uh, contestants and they're gonna come up one by one and give their presentation. So without further ado, here we go. The research team of Lori Cutting, Stephanie Del Tufo, and Tin Nguyen from Vanderbilt University seek to understand 
What combination of brain structure and home learning environment create resiliency in children raised in adversity and poverty? Please welcome Tin Wim. All right, of course, being the first person, this is a lot of anxiety. So um, thank you for not laughing yet again. <laughs> so well, just to start, I thank you, everyone, for being here with me and the opportunity to, um, for me to share this exciting project on resiliency with, um, with the team. So this project has been cooking up in our lab by the team of Drs. Lori Cutting, Stephen Latufo, myself, and other members at the Education and Brand Research Lab at Vanderbilt University. So um, we want to take the simple questions and kind of ask it a more complex, with a more complex demand as to how poverty can negatively impact the brain of children and their education but how through resiliency, through the brain, that these children from poverty can still thrive and achieve um, in their education. And uh, before starting with these ambitions, I think that we should start walking through the actual inspirations and motivation that hide behind the current of this project. And of course, it started in San Antonio, Texas, right here in town. And on one evening, um, on afternoon actually, on a Friday afternoon, uh, when I was interning at the Mind Science Foundation, I was talking to Miriam Good, and we both were talking about these. <laughs> we were talking about these um, majors, um, uh, figures in the education reforms world, such as Ken Robinson and Alfie Kahn, and their attempt to bring to the uh, to the community the attentions that poverty um, negatively influenced children's um, classroom performance. Is is sad. Miriam and I were frustrated. So, but you know what, this really sparked um, a motivation in me to make a change. And I kid you not, the Monday after that, I started volunteering with the San Antonio Youth Literacy as a reading tutor. And my first assignment was at Bonham Academy. And most of you local know that it's a Title I school support children from poverty. And my first assignment was with two boys from the second grades. And you know, little did they, did they know, these were the inspirations for me to be here on the stage. So a little bit about these boys was that they were from um, low-income households. They were reading at kindergarten level, despite the fact that they were in second grade. Their parents was having multiple jobs to support their family, so there was not a lot of room for educational support at home. But you know what? As simple as for me to spend some classroom hours with them, to, to read with them, for them to read to me, this really, you know, motivated them to read more, kind of sparked some excitement in them to read more and, you know, develop a more natural curiosity to see learn overall. And after a whole academic year, they read above their peers, way beyond their grade. So this was incredible. One that, I mean, I was happy that my broken English at the time was of six years was able to help someone, but but you know, these two boys were the only two of the 70% of the students in Texas that performed below the national standards for reading and language. And we know these are the uh, crucial skills for them to be active members of the society. But secondly, I want to ask, how can we effectively support these children from poverty? Is there something more we can do than just reading it to them? And you know, children from poverty are typically have less access to healthcare, nutrition, material resources, and of course, educational resources at home. But we know that, um, and as you recall that from my and Marian frustration from earlier, is that these factors of poverty bleed themselves into children's performance in the classroom, where children from poverty perform poorer as compared to their peers from a well-off background. But you know what? This is not the case for everyone from poverty. Some children from poverty manage to thrive and excel in the classroom. And you can already guess this, these children are thought to be resilient. So now we have the hook. We know that we can potentially do more, and we can ask the questions of what and how we can do to further promote resilience in these children. So while this is very ambitious, we have two specific goals in mind. For our first goal, we ask, is there, what is the difference between children from poverty that have resilience versus not? Does the biological basis of consciousness, such as the brain, would be able to you know, 
give rise to resilience and protect children from poverty. And for our second goal, we want to shift our attention back to what I did at Central Youth Literacy. Just a very simple act of reading and something that you as parents and your children read for bedtime story. Whether the stimulating home environment could further interact with the brain and together could you know, underscore resilience further to protect children from poverty. So to answer these questions, why start with the brain? So we all here know that human consciousness, especially even early during childhood, that is the product of, that it absorbs all these surrounding experiences, even those from poverty. But, and indeed, using brain imaging, a lot of studies have shown that children from poverty tend to have much thinner and less expanding grammatical cortex, especially in the left prefrontal cortex, or the left PFC as shown in red. And most of you know that this is the center of executive functions, working memory, and planning goal-directed activities that help children go through from day to day as a functioning society member. And you know what? Our lab has also shown that the left PFC might be the seed to resiliency in education performance amongst these children. So now we ask whether the left PFC could potentially be also boost the resilience in children from poverty. Because now we know that the brain could potentially control resiliency, so what else can we do with it? So moving on to the second goal, we want to shift our attention back to what is of particular importance to, the, to resilience within the context of home, such as the cognitively stimulating the language home, just like you know the engagement between the parents and the child, reading activities at home before the bedtime. Or you can think of this as like the language nutrition that help parents who nourishes their child's brain and cognitive development. And guess what? Our team has also shown that beyond the impact of poverty, that reading together with the children can potentially boost the growth of brain regions that support language and literacy skills in reading, such as the left superior temporal cortex or the left STC as shown in red, uh, as shown in green right here. So now we know that. We know the first goal about the left prefrontal cortex. The next question we ask is whether this factor of the home environment could further interact with the brain. And together, if the left STC and the left PFC could interact together to work together and further promote resilience in these children from poverty. So to boil down everything, we did perform our study in 340 children, followed them starting from first grade to fourth grade, take pictures of their brain, and ask parents about the activities that they engage, such as reading and literacy, likewise, at the home environment. And for our first goal, like I mentioned earlier, that we want to look at the brain, like what of these like biological basis of consciousness differentiate between children who are from poverty, who have versus have do not do not have resilience, and compare those children from more well-off background and see if this part of the brain is more unique to children from poverty. And for our next goal, we ask whether these literacy reading activities that engage between the parents and the child, what you do at that time with your children, can further interact with the brain to underscore resilience together. So that is to wrap up, wrap up my presentations. And here we're trying to argue that, you know, human consciousness and especially during childhood that is highly buffered, is that not only that poverty can negatively impact the brain, but through resiliency that childhood consciousness can allow it to plan itself with parental care and warmth to further support them to thrive and succeed in school. And thank you. And we can do this without all the engineers, scientists, um, teachers, educators that are part of our lab at the Education and Brain Research Lab at Vanderbilt. And there's my email if you have questions. And to that, I thank everyone. Thank you, Xin Wen. The research team of Justin Holbert and Michael Greenberg from Bard College wants us to know whether it's possible to hack your brain using mindfulness meditation to strengthen self-control and autonomy. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Greenberg. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to ask you all to please raise your hand if you have ever been in the midst of a perfectly enjoyable conversation 
and yet you were still not quite able to stop yourself from checking your phone when you got a notification. <laughs> yeah, I knew I wasn't the only rude one in the house tonight. Um, I, I am, of course, just kidding. I know that in the moment, such an act might be interpreted as rude or perhaps insensitive, but it's just so automatic. And that's kind of the point, right? In reality, both the thought to grab my phone and the act of grabbing my phone are just two of countless automatic responses that over time have been reinforced to the point of becoming automatic. And we have all kinds of these responses, and of course they are not all bad. For example, hitting the gas pedal when a traffic light turns green. The issue with developing automatized responses is not that they cannot be helpful. It's that they can be hard to overcome when circumstances change. Hitting the gas pedal at a green light may not be the best idea when another car runs through a red light. I'm sure we have all heard the horrific uh, but true stories of sometimes fatal car accidents being caused by someone checking a text message. And these anecdotes can make us feel powerless. But what if I were to tell you that we have the ability to develop better, more flexible control over our thoughts and behaviors? And what if I told you that the ability to do this has been within you the entire time? I don't mean to sound like the uncle of a superhero, <laughs> but I do want to invite you to spend the next few minutes getting curious about the potential of developing a more sensitive connection between the contents of our conscious awareness and our responses <coughs> to those contents. What I'm referring to is conscious control, the term the scientific community uses for our ability to inhibit a habitual behavior or thought in response to a stimulus. So it's great that we have this, but can we improve it? So, uh, I'm sorry. Um, can we improve it? Um, research suggests uh, that, in fact, we can. And life offers many natural opportunities to do so. Uh, consider someone who has just been through a trauma, perhaps a natural disaster or the loss of a loved one. Reminders of these can cause uncontrollable flashbacks and loss of physical control. And psychological trauma is far more widespread than many people realize, affecting up to 84% of my peers in the undergraduate college population alone. And while 7 to 8% of people do go on to develop persistent PTSD in the wake of these experiences, fortunately, most do recover. And in fact, work out of our research group has provided suggestive evidence that learning to cope with these reminders may actually measurably build resilience. Fortunately, practice need not be traumatic to be effective. So take heart, because I am here to discuss a more positive method for developing conscious control abilities. And speaking of hearts, allow me to introduce you to yours. Or rather, allow me to introduce you to your heart rate variability. It looks something like this. Heart rate variability is, in essence, a measure of your heart's sensitivity to the external environment. The extent to which your beat-to-beat -beat heart rate varies in response to different stimuli. And heart rate variability has been linked to all kinds of positive physical and mental health outcomes, including improved conscious control. That's right, it's looking like the sensitivity of our brains might have something to do with the sensitivity of our hearts. And there are a number of techniques which have been identified for producing reliable changes in heart rate variability. These include low intensity aerobic training, eating a Mediterranean diet, or taking cold showers. Fortunately, we are interested in a more accessible method that does not require a masochistic morning routine. <laughs> Mindfulness has been having quite the moment in our culture. And at this point, it can be very easy to roll our eyes and dismiss it as a fad. But it is important to remember that underneath all of the mass marketing is an evidence-backed technique for improving all manner of markers of well-being, including heart rate variability. And this brings us to the specific research question being posed by the undergraduates in our lab. Do the effects of mindfulness meditation on heart rate variability lead to improvements in conscious control? To test this, we will recruit people who have no experience with meditation for a double-blind, randomized controlled trial, considered to be the gold standard for testing the effectiveness of interventions. In accordance, we will randomly assign participants to one of three conditions in which they will be asked to follow a 30-day guided audio training program delivered online. 
Participants in one condition will listen to a mindfulness meditation training program two times per day for 10 minutes each time. Participants in the other two conditions will similarly be led to believe that they have been assigned to the same meditation condition. Their audio programs, however, while matched in many ways to the experimental mindfulness condition, will instead focus on meditating in ways that do not engage mindfulness. To be specific, either probing their stream of consciousness or listening to relaxing nature sounds. Before and after these interventions, participants will be invited into the lab for a set of widely used and validated tests, which can detect changes in both conscious control and heart rate variability. We hypothesize that at the end of the training period, participants in the mindfulness condition will display increases in conscious control, and that these changes will be explained, or that is, mediated by changes in heart rate variability. Such findings could mean something as simple as being able to resist the urge to check your phone when you receive a notification. But for countless others, either living with or predisposed to control abilities, or those living in particularly volatile circumstances, such findings could pump new hope for a brighter future through their hearts and into their minds. So tonight, we ask you all to mind your hearts and help us make this proposal a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Michael Greenberg, thank you. The research team of Hakun Lau and Vincent Tesho du Michel from the University of California at Los Angeles looked to determine how virtual reality and neurofeedback could lead to a treatment for anxiety disorders like OCD. Here is Vincent Tesho du Michel. All right, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for being here. Your generosity means a lot for us young researchers, where uh, sometimes it's hard to get our project uh, realized. So thank you very much for, uh, uh, for your support. Um, I am trying to address kind of a science fiction question. It sounds as if it's out of like a book we could read. Uh, is there a way that we can train people to change some very specific pattern of activity in their brain and doing this unconsciously? If we could do that, uh, it could actually have very important incidents for uh, the treatment of some mental disorders. Because uh, sometimes we really know what we're looking for in the brain, but we just don't have means to help people change them. Um, to help you understand a bit better what I'm trying to do, uh, I'll conduct a little experiment. Uh, I'm a scientist, so I have IRB regulation. I have to tell you that it may be a little bit uh, aversive. Uh, so if you don't give your full consent, you can just look away for a minute. It's going to be over very soon. <laughs> it, it's not that bad. <laughs> so just try to imagine that you are here uh, outside San, Anto uh, San Antonio. You uh, are hiking, beautiful sunny day, and out of a sudden, you come across this little guy here. Uh, and he looks like he means business. Um, I suppose that uh, one of your first reaction would be to freeze, your mind may sweat, uh, your mind, your, <laughs> your, your hand may sweat a little bit, and your heart rate will accelerate. Generally, your body will prepare to defend itself. Well, this whole reaction is one of the, the, the reaction that has been studied the most in the anxiety disorders. It's been associated with the subjective report of fear, it's been associated with many anxiety disorders, and it's actually been used to measure uh, outcome of some treatment, too. Um, we know quite a lot about this, uh, this reaction in the brain uh, because people have been trying to change it for so long. Uh, we know that it's generated by the amygdala and we uh, actually can train some fancy machine learning decoder that we, that we call uh, to recognize if, for instance, a person was presented with a snake. So that's very useful. It's basically like uh, the way uh, machine learning recognizes cat in image, but now it's for the brain. We just have a decoder that will tell us, well, there's a 70% likelihood that that person is actually seeing a snake right now. Uh, I'm telling you this because this is one, piece of, one important piece of the puzzle. If we use this decoder and we combine this with a method called neurofeedback, well, maybe we can train people to change that representation in their brain. Here is what we did before. What we do is we have people in the scanner um, thinking, and we, we, we ask them try to activate a specific pattern in your brain. We don't know what it is. They, it, it is fully unconscious. 
We read this activity online and we display back uh, the likelihood of the decoder. So let's say a 70% likelihood of activating the snake here. The little trick is that we give them money. So what we want to do is, let's say before that you have snake equals I want to run. After that, you will have snake equal money. So that sounds easy. It's not that easy, but that, that's what worked for us before. Actually, we showed that we can decrease the physiological reactivity of people who are afraid of some animal doing this uh, strategy. Um, and it is actually the principle of exposure therapy that's been a very successful therapy. And you might ask, well, why not do that? <laughs> why would that be better to use our uh, unconscious method? Uh, well, exposure therapy is actually very aversive. Um, let's, uh, let's imagine that you are afraid of germ. Uh, you have a, a condition called obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, one of the things you fear the most is germs. So exposure therapy will be uh, training you to eat food off of the ground, uh, licking doorknobs, uh, all those kind of things that you absolutely ate. So it is uh, super aversive. And some people that have OCD have told me that, well, exposure therapy is basically the hardest thing they've ever had to do. So if we could do something unconsciously, that could be very helpful to them. What we want to do is, conduct in the scanner an experiment with, oh, with uh, surrogate participants that will lend their brain to be exposed to the said situation. So we will have participants roaming a house and be exposed to clean toilets, uh, dirty toilets, uh, dirty hands, clean hands, and all of these situations, and we will use an approach that we used successfully before to actually use the data of that group of surrogates to guess what the decoder for the participants that we want to treat will be. That worked well for us before with the animals and using virtual reality. We think that we might end up having a very good decoder that may uh, reflect very well how immersive some of these experiments might be. In OCD, you will uh, have like that body component of being afraid of being contaminated yourself. So that is um, basically what we were trying to do, trying to use that surrogate group of participants to train our contamination decoder and also uh, asymmetry. So that's something that is very uh, important in OCD as well. And then we will try to uh, achieve our neurofeedback, try to decrease their, uh, their sensitivity to these, these, these conditions. That one step, um, after that, we, uh, let's say we start with contamination, but the same therapy can be applied to the fear of height, could be applied to agoraphobia, social anxiety, and ultimately, uh, even maybe post-traumatic stress disorder are like all therapy that benefit from exposure therapy that might ultimately benefit also from that kind of treatment. So, uh, well, thank you very much for your attention and for your generous donations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vincent Tachel, du Michel. And welcome back, Miriam. Good. <laughs> All right, it's time to vote. Get out your golden tickets. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Uh, you all have these packets, and, uh, but don't open them quite yet. We're very close to the opening, and you have these cubes, which are kind of interesting too. So you might say, what's this all about? So we're here, and, and I, just like last year, I have to say, it's, it's so exciting that you've built this community here in San Antonio to support innovative science. And this brainstorm is so exciting because, as they pointed out, it's really great to support young researchers from important teams from around the world and, and do their research. So what we're all interested in is how we think, how that relates to the way we behave. And um, this is actually a very useful tool to think about complex things, right? Because it seems impossible, doesn't it? I mean, if you've seen somebody do it, and, and if you mix these things up, you, you, it kind of looks impossible. So just, if I mix this one up like so, it looks completely impossible, like this. If I, do you see it like this? Okay, now, what we're gonna, we're gonna try something 
we're going to try and experiment with a video camera. And, and Steffi is here. Is it ready? Okay, it's almost ready. We're going to see in slow motion if we can make this thing. Now, this was invented 45 years ago by a man teaching design and architecture in, in Budapest. And his dad was one of the most famous engineers in Hungary. He built uh, metal gliders. And they were actually really unusual because when the glider landed, sometimes it would have problems. And it was made in a modular structure so you could replace a wing or a tail or whatever you needed to. But he, he came from an innovative family and he was frustrated that his students couldn't follow complex ideas. And one basic idea, yeah, right? Does it sound familiar? Okay. <laughs> so, so what he did was he wanted to find something that would teach people to think in systematically. Now this cube, it's really kind of amazing because if you actually Google the Wikipedia of group theory in mathematics, you will find a picture of this because it actually illustrates group theory in a way that mathematicians still can't believe. Many graduate level courses feature this thing. And that's because, just for an example, if you try to solve this thing from the colors, you're gonna get all confused. But if you think about the pieces underneath those colors, you can start to put it together. But what's strange is they all have different ways of being. You see, the centers don't move, right? The centers are only one color. The centers, actually, Erno Rubik calls them middles, right? They only have one state, right? The corners, can you see? The corners are another piece. And how many states do the corners have? No, how many colors? Three. So it's three states. And those pieces in between, the middles and the corners, are called edges. And how many states do those have? Two. Right? So you have these one state centers or middles, you have these two state edges, and you have these, these, uh, these corners that are three state. So it's a total of 27 pieces, but there's only six of these middles. There is uh, eight corners, 12 edges, and of course there's also the gimbal inside that drives the whole thing. Right? That's what allows you to turn it. Right? So the question is, how do you even solve this thing? Does the camera ready? Okay, Steffi, come on over. Uh, you, know, you can come right down here because we'll get a better close-up. Up there, you can see some of the early prototypes. Because for Erno Rubik, part of the puzzle, there, were, there was a tetrahedral twisty puzzle. There was a two-by-two. Two. No one had invented the three-by-three three because they couldn't figure it out. So we're going to try to get this picture here of this cube. And I need everybody... Okay, we're, we're trying to switch to it. We'll see if it doesn't work. We'll just do it. Okay? Are we close? There. Oh, there it is. Okay, this is a slight time delay because it's a GoPro, as you can see. Okay, is it? Oh, oh, maybe it's locked. Oh, it's locked. Okay, we've got a lot of... What I'm going to try to do... Well, you can kind of see it. It's in very slow motion. This is high-tech, low-tech. <laughs> oh, there it's speeding up. All right, so watch it carefully. On the count of three, I want everybody to simply say Mind Science Foundation. One, two, three. And that'll do it. And you see that? Almost like in slow motion, it comes right back. Let's give Steffi a very big hand. Thank you very much for making that happen. So now you can rip open your secret envelopes. There's cards in there, because if I was to explain algorithms with this, it would take a long time. Now, algorithms are any kind of process. You know, did you get, anybody see the movie Hidden Figures? Right, it's a great movie, and you could see that computers used to be people, right? Used to be people working really hard in a room, doing the same process mathematically or physically again and again. In a weird way, if you have your shoes repaired, the craftsman is following an algorithm. He's following a process to fix your shoes, making slight modifications in the process so it'll actually really work. So to make this thing work, to get all of those different states to go together, you need to start thinking in processes, and processes come together. Now, in the brain, this is also true, because we know that we think things, but we also physically do things, and we also are socially interactive with other people. So... And all those, those states of information, th th that, those kinds of information have different states and different processes associated with this. So this thing, 
Erno Rubik says he likes to think of this as a way to do basic research on his brain. Because when he did this, when he took the... Uh, actually, could we get the picture of the prototype up there? He made a very simple wooden one. That one down in the lower left-hand corner, or the lower right-hand corner from there, uh, you can see is the original prototype. And it took him 40 days once he made this thing. He said, for me, there was three puzzles. The first puzzle was how to make it in a three-by-three. Because he thought of this thing as an X, Y, Z axis kind of exploding, right? And then the next problem was, how do you solve it? It took him 40 days. He didn't know if he could solve it once he mixed it up. And then the final puzzle was how to manufacture this so that a lot of people could have it, right? He, he was more shocked, uh, but he still kept teaching until he was 40, even though he discovered this thing uh, in his late 20s. So, um, so here we go. The, um, uh, in, instead of teaching you algorithms with this, we, I should thank all the speed cubers who are here back there, and they're going to come up later and do something really spectacular. So, but right now, what we're going to do is we're going to switch to cards and algorithm because I can do those. Well, actually, let's just do one quick trick, you know, because I realize it's too much fun. Um, th has anybody already mixed up a cube? I realize I shouldn't use this one. If somebody's mixed up a cube, it's going to be much better. It's, oh, well, that's perfect. What's your name? This is Rose's mixed up cube. I'm going to place it right in here. And if I just place it right in like so and shake it up, it comes out completely. Isn't that amazing? This is a trick that anybody can do. Anybody can do it if you have two cubes. It's simple. It's effective. Oh, man. Wait. Okay, but there is something else. You know, there's new categories in speed cubing because uh, our team here, that's, they are from the Texas Speed Cubing uh, Group. And, and uh, what's amazing is there's a new category. It's not even in speed cubing yet. Um, but could you, would you mind holding this up for me? Because there's another way. There's a new category. And there's actually a young man from Germany who's, who's really fast at this. And he tried to t teach me some basic ideas. And if I just try it, I don't know if this is even possible, but um, maybe. Wait. Thank you. I need it. What I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is a re-scramble. But actually, can I be on? Oh, 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 she's coming back with this. You know, and I got to be on. Are you guys any? Re, are there any re-scramblers out there? You, the truth is, I, I, I'm under so much pressure. I, I actually, I messed up. I, I, I didn't get it. I got. I'll be honest. Um, but wait, but wait. I'm going to try this just for you. I've got to do something dramatic. I'm going to try a one-handed solve because I have been working at this for some time. And I don't know if this is even possible. But if I just do this, and again, I can't guarantee anything, as you just saw, because actually these cubes are beautiful cubes with a Mind Science Foundation logo on it. It's a little bit different than the cubes that I actually use. But what I'm going to try to do, if I can, oh, man, okay? Okay. Okay. Oh man. Let's I maybe. I can't guarantee. Okay. Oh. Thank you. There it is. Good. I'm scared. All right. So but here's what's great. On those sheets, you all have you, you see in there there's actually instruction sheets and you'll actually see an interview with Erno Rubik that he recorded a few years ago where he talks about his passion for the cube and how it can help you think, right? And then also there's three different links. So one of them is with absolutely no notation and it's just done with the colors and it will lead you through how to solve the cube. Uh, there's another, then the other two are, uh, have different kinds of approaches to solving the cube. What I would suggest is try the first step with each one and see which approach you like the best. But all I can say is, is I never thought I would learn how to do it. And what happened was my wife learned before me. 
And I, to live with myself, I had to try to learn how to solve the cube. But you can talk to Susanna about it, because that's, that's why I learned. So right now, instead of talking about algorithms of the cube, we're going to talk about um, algorithms with these playing cards that you have. You'll notice that in addition to the sheets that tell you about your Rubik's Cubes, you also have five cards. And what I'd like you to do is look at those five cards and pick one, pick one that just kind of stands out. Okay? In this case, I'm going to use an ace of spades. All right? But you can use any card you want. The other four, you're also going to do something interesting with. And all you need to do is take those cards and fold them in half the long way. Just not all of them, just one of the cards. Take out one and just fold one the long way. All right? Just one card, fold it the long way, and then fold it back the other way so you get a nice fold right down the center. Okay? So it folds like so. Okay, that's step number one. And step number two is this. On one of the sides, rip it to the center like so. Just rip it right down the center, just like this. Like this. Okay, and just go to the center and stop. And then on the other side, you're actually going to cut at the quarter mark. You're just going to divide that distance in half and rip halfway down. On, this is on the other side, and rip to the center. And on the other side, rip halfway down and rip to the center. Just leave the middle as it is. And you're going to have a card that's almost destroyed. <laughs> right? Now, one of the things magicians know is that people have a hard time conceptualizing certain things. And there was two guys, there was a guy named Listing and a guy named Mobius, who in 1858 came up with a Mobius strip. And it's a really unusual shape that has, that you, you know, it's a twisted loop. And this is actually a simple way to think about that space there called the hyperbolic plane. Because what you're going to do is take the card and twist it. That's very hard for people to calculate. And you're going to see that right now. Because what you're left with is like a little puzzle. And if you lay it on your hand, you'll see something funny. It looks like the center is cut out from both sides. Do you see that? I learned this from a wonderful mathematical artist named Harry Ng, who did this. These, this is called a hypercard, believe it or not. So it's kind of like a, it's like a, it's like a Mobius strip, but just made in two dimensions. But what you're, what you're seeing is that twist, and you're seeing how your mind has a hard time calculating it. Yeah, do you all see it? OK, sorry. So you go from this condition, so it's ripped to the center on one side, and then you're ripping at a quarter and also at three quarters on the other side down to the center, and you're left with this, and then you're going to twist it like that. And that twist is going to leave you with this strange item known as a hypercard where it looks like you've got a center that's been torn out of both sides of the card. Did you get it? Isn't that, it's an odd little thing, isn't it? It's one of these things. So put it on your desk when you go home, and you'll see it gets more confusing. It's one of those strange things. Now with your other cards, we're going to look at sometimes in this era of big data and, and uh, robots and, and, and AI, uh, artificial intelligence, we think of algorithms as truth tellers as something that's going to give us the actual answer. But what's one thing that magicians know is these processes or algorithms or routines can actually just have surprising results. So you can put that rip card away, and that leaves you with just four cards. So take those four cards out, and with these cards, I'm going to teach you a strange algorithm. With even groups of numbers, you get this very strange thing called parity, which is just like odd and even. And we're going to, I'm going to show you how odd it is. Spread out the cards and just take two cards and pick them up. Okay? That's good. And put them back. This is just warm up for the real stuff. Okay? 
And then the next thing is, when I say cut the cards, because not, you know, not everybody's a card player. I grew up a strict Baptist, so I was not a card player. So, so just cut the cards anywhere you want. By a cut, I mean take some cards from the top, put them on the bottom. So this would be a cut. That would be a cut. My mother still doesn't understand this. But, it's, it's, but that, that's the cut. So you need to know two cards and a cut. So now what I want you to do is mix the cards all up. Do not look at them, because you're going to use this mix-up to choose your card to surprise yourself, right? And now, look at the bottom card, okay? And I'll show you what my bottom card is, but see what your bottom card is. And that is your selection, all right? Now, follow carefully. Take the top card and put it on the bottom. Just one card, put it right on the bottom, okay? Take the next card and turn it over right on top of the deck. Okay? And now, go back and wherever you like, cut the cards. Take some cards from the top and put them on the bottom. Okay? In fact, give them another cut. Take some cards from the top, put them on the bottom. Now, take two cards and turn them over. Put them back on top, right? And now cut the cards anywhere. Turn the whole pile over. Right? Turn the whole pile over. Take the top two cards and turn those over. Just two. Take the top two ones. Put those over. Now cut them wherever you like. It does not matter. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is take the top card, the top card as it is, and we're going to turn it over and put it back on top. We're going to take the top card now that we've just turned over and put that on the bottom. The next card, we're going to put on the bottom, as it is. And the next card, we're going to turn over just like this. Right? And now, if you spread your cards out, you'll notice that only one card is different than the others, and that is your selection. <laughs> did, it, did everybody get it? Okay, okay. If you want to look up, so here's what's weird. It's a mathematical principle. It's called parity violation. P-A-R-I-T-Y. And what makes that trick work is you just committed a parity violation on yourself. How does that feel? Okay, I don't know. okay that's a little scary. All right, so now, now we're going to, now we're going to, that's a trick that shows you about you know, uh, you know, algorithms. Now we're going to do a trick that shows some social interaction, all right? So now what I want you to do is I'm going to take, like in this case, I'm going to take these two red mail cards and my ace of spades and leave the black queen over by my ripped card. So now you just need three cards and a neighbor because this whole trick is going to teach you something socially, right? So uh, in fact, would you like to join me, sir? Gary, would you like to join me? You don't have to say yes. You, okay, he doesn't fill it. Okay, we, okay, this young woman from back, why don't you both come up? This is asking for trouble. These two young kids are, I know this is possible. This could be trouble right now. All right? All right, so your job, okay, so here we have a king of hearts. It goes down here. And here I have an ace of spades and a uh, jack of diamonds, all right? So if I take the king and place it right here, I take the ace and move it up there, where is the ace of spades? Could you, okay, turn, take that one. Oh, oh, wait, so wait, 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 what did you say? You said it was here? Oh, you got it right. And you said it was the middle one? Oh, man, I'm really bad at this. I don't know if this is possible. Wait. I'm going to have to get the small cards. I was worried about these guys. So I've got smaller cards because I, I, I wasn't sure I'd be able to fool them with the big ones. So I want you to find, oh, here, we'll change it all up so it's very dramatic. I have, these are a little bit smaller, but I'll be able to actually do it. I've got a queen of spades and a nine of diamonds and a ten of diamonds. And your ch challenge, should you choose to accept it, I want you to find that queen of spades, all right? I'm going to mix it all up like this. Where is the queen of spades? Okay, she says there, right? And you say the center, okay? Turn it over, right? And of course, right. All right, so now, now I'm back where it should be. 
Now we're going to try it with an almost unlimited amount of money. Okay, here's a big wad of cash. All right? Okay. Okay. So now... Okay, shh, shh. Be discreet. Okay. All right, okay. There's the queen of spades. I'll just go like this and put your money right on the queen of spades. Right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Settle money away. And of course, the, oh, sorry, I thought it was there. And there it is, the queen of spades. So now how does this work? You're all going to do this to each other with your cards. Okay, you can see this. If I try to do this, I have to switch the cards. But if I try to switch the cards up here, they'll see it, right? Because And if I try to switch the cards once I'm past, if I'm down here, you guys will see it, right? You'll see the switch. You're way ahead of me. Are you like 15 years old? That's really impressive, okay? So where should I do it? If I can't do it here and I can't do it there, where should I do it? See, these guys already know this intuitively. And this is what I always say. Deception is really something. Who is more deceptive than young children like these? <laughs> right? You know it, right? So if I take the cards here and I move it down like that, right, I've already switched them. So the point is they're following the wrong card. So, and there's not even any sleight of hand to this. I call it the, the window wiper, right? It's not even a fancy move. So just try this. Take two of your cards, and you're going to see something else that's really funny, an optical illusion, which is when you switch them, they look actually, it looks more like the center card than when you don't switch them. You see, if I take the queen and I move it down, I didn't switch them, and it looks wrong. If I switch it, there's an optical illusion, and the center card looks more like the center card. But you have to do it right when you pass your neighbor's eyes. So maybe break off two by two, as if you're on Noah's Ark, and then, right? And then actually just, so you guys do it to each other. First, try to fool, what, you try to fool each other. They're going to show you how to do this. Do you understand it? So you, you put the prominent card in front of the two. It's got to be in the front to make the illusion better, like that. And you're just going to do this with your, your two fingers. You got it? Yeah. Well, you, okay, well, you do it, okay? You do it back and forth. Are you doing it? Oh, good. That's great. I know, but okay. So now, I got her twice in a row. And tell me your names. Lauren. Lauren and Alice. Okay, Aunt Lauren and Alice. Okay. All right, let's hear for Lauren and Alice because they were so generous. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So now you've got these four cards. Okay, we're really okay. We're really close. Okay, I'm going to try to slip in two big dramatic stunts, and we have. A, we have a special dramatic stunt coming up. Take your cards, there are four cards, they're precious, but I hate to say it, you can do this at home with some other cards, but this time I want you to fold them in half the other way. See, now they're folded in half the other way so that they're, right? Yeah, all four. I know, I know, it's a shame. It's a shame, right? I'm sorry about that. All right? And now fold them in half like this, and now you're gonna tear through the center you're gonna, I know it's, a, it's just a, it's a terrible shame, but we're doing this for a demonstration. All right? So now you have these two piles, and now take one pile and put it on top of the other pile. Okay? And then, so I just took one pile and I put it on top of the other pile. And now, spread the cards out like this. Spread them out. So, okay? Uh, spread them out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, okay, just spread them out. Did everybody do this? Oh, wait. If you can't tear them, if you can't tear them collectively, tear them one by one. But, but it's better if you can tear them, spread them out just a little bit. That's, if you want to know the secret of tearing a telephone book, don't try to tear it directly. Spread them out a little bit and then tear. So if you spread the cards out just a little bit, you'll find that they should tear right in half. 
Okay, were you able to do it? Oh, perfect. Now, so now take your card. So now you have a total of eight halves, right? And sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Well, let's just hope for the best. I want you to take the top three cards, right? Take the top three half cards and bury them somewhere in the center of your cards. Just the top three, okay? Just like so. Good? And bury them somewhere. And now, this, oh, I forgot an important thing. Did you all do that? Okay? Now, I forgot one important thing. So take this next piece without looking at it, and maybe sit on it or put it in a pocket. Put it someplace where you know it, okay? You're, you're, where you're safe, okay? Now, take one, two, or three cards and bury them in the center. Okay? One, two, or three cards, bury them in the center. Now, okay, and this is a little scary, take one, two, or three cards and drop them on the floor. It's a little scary. I'd say throw them in the air, but it's, we don't want to go out of, completely out of control, right? Okay, there's, there's two on the floor. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to get them out of the way for our coming photo ops. There we go. Okay. So now we just got two, right? So now we're down to here, and now, now we have to go through the days of the week. And just to make it easy, we're going to start, we, I know it's Tuesday, but we're going to start with Monday, and we're going to go to Sunday. Take the card from the top and just put it on the bottom and say Monday. Take the next card and say Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now we've gone through the days of the week. Time has passed. Let's hope this thing works. Now, take the top card, and everybody collectively, just, uh, just say, she loves me. Put it on the bottom. Take the next one and say, she loves me not, and throw it away. Take the next one on top and put it on the bottom and say, she loves me. Take the next one and throw it away and say, she loves you not. Take the next one and say, she loves me. Put it on the bottom. And take the next one and say, she loves me not. Throw it away. Take the next one and say, she loves me. Put it on the bottom. Take the next one. If you don't have one, just don't worry about it. Hold your last one. But if you do have an extra one, throw it away and say, she loves me not. If you have any more, do it one more time if you have one more. Because some people might have one more and say, she loves me, she loves me not. Now... You have that special card that you put away, and you have this card, and wouldn't it be strange if those two cards matched? <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> Close? She got it? You got it! All right, big hand for everybody who did it! And now, I'm going to bring up some special guests for a big finale over here. I'm going to put this away. We, and are you ready, Steffi? We've got our specialists. We've got, okay, let's hear for all of our, we have Wesley Grady over there. But right now, we're going to get Casey Tharp and, and, and Kat, her dog, Captain, and also Mike Elliott. Could you come on up? We've got a chair right here. And actually, one of the amazing things about human beings is that when they first released the Rubik's Cube, they thought it was too impossible. They thought nobody would want to do it. What happened was, some people learned how to excel. And actually, if you think about it, this really does match a, a guy like Tom Slick, you know, who started this foundation, who kind of believed in the impossible. And sometimes it just seems impossible. Here's Mike Elliott. Okay, let's a big hand for Mike. And Casey Tharp. And Captain. And do you want somebody? What would you like? Okay, wait. And do we have a... We need a microphone, I realize, because it's going to be more entertaining. Oh, thank you. Here. And let's hear for Sal, Joshua, and Susanna for helping with all the tech. Thank you very much, guys. And I'm going to give... Oh, there... Oh, oh, oh look it. Captain is very excited. Okay? All right. Oh, okay. Okay. Very affectionate. Uh, he's, yeah, he's captain's in training. So, okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. So I realize, so do you want to tell me what to do? Because we're going to try is one of the most impossible stunts 
that speed cubers do. It's going to be performed by two of the Texas Speed Cubing Association members. And um, if you're interested in speed cubing, be sure to see them after this event. OK, you ready? And so what would you like? Uh, let's go and have the audience scramble this up. OK, so we need a scrambler. Is there somebody who's a really great scrambled? Somebody who's naturally confusing? <laughs> OK, over here, we'll take this cube. And what's your name? Jenny is the most confused person here tonight. And Jenny just mixed that thing up. Her mom's in agreement. OK, that's understandable. And I want you to just keep messing that thing up and bring it up so that people don't think that I do something special. Or right? Is that fair enough? All right? OK, and how long have you guys been cubing? About 15 minutes. Wait, could you have that gentleman just give it a little extra mix? And tell me, wait, no, 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 no. We need, because if I pass it, they'll think I did something. So tell me your name again. Jenny. Jenny, and, and you've always been confused? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> all right, good, great. Okay, so this is all, and do you want to place it right in Mike's hands? And wait, there's one more thing. Because I need to take a look at it first. Oh, okay. So, okay, so, so what you're going to pass that to Casey, and Casey is going to look at it to study the cube. Because she's going to be doing, study her, and could you keep the camera on, Casey, so she doesn't do anything tricky, okay? And I want you to put this blindfold on yourself and see, okay, and just see if it's solid, you know, if there's any kind of trick thing. Look out at the audience. <laughs> Very funny, Mike. Very funny. All right, good? Okay, and it's, it's a real blindfold, right? So this is a real blindfold, and... Mike is going to place this blindfold on, and he's going to solve this cube in an act of faith. All right, so let's have a big hand for this wonderful person. Thank you for mixing it all up. All right, this is called... Team blindfold solving. Okay, we'll double, double check. You want to check? All right. Check, check. Is this on? Is this on? Can anybody hear me? All right, it's on. Okay, good. Okay, this is team blindfold solving. I'm going to be telling Mike what to do, and he will be doing the moves that I tell him. All right, how many cross moves can you remember at one time? Four or five? Okay. Uh, we're gonna do. I'm gonna have you do D prime, B two, F, from right there. Go ahead. Okay, tilt, good, um, you're gonna do an R, uh, U prime, B2, tilt, yep, okay, that's our cross. Uh, let me see the left side of the cube, okay. Um, U prime, um, U prime again, sorry. Pull right, U, pull right. Uh, let me see the left side and the back. Okay. Uh, spin twice. U2. Uh, push right. U. Pull right. Uh, U. Uh, back right twice. U. Uh, push back right. Yes. Uh, spin left. Okay, uh, pull right, U prime, push right, uh, U2, spin right, pull left. Uh, U, edges bar. Uh, this is the anti soon. Yep, uh, U2, and it's the good J perm. And you're done. <laughs> That's amazing! Let's hear from Mike Elliott, Casey Tharp, thank you, and Captain. And thank you very, very much. That was fantastic. And Steffi on camera, thank you. Way to go! Thank you very, very much. Wow, absolutely amazing. And now we're getting very close to our announcements before. We'd like to welcome back Miriam Good and the winner of Brainstorm 2018, Subhulakshmi 
Sankra Subramanian, here they are. All right. Again, how do we how do we top that? I'll tell you how we top that. We're going to talk to last year's winner, Subu Sankara Subramanian, and we wanted to hear from her. First of all, Subu, what was your experience going back to Cambridge, landing, getting back to university? What was the response of your colleagues, your classmates? What was it like for you when you went back? First of all, I don't know if we can top that, but we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the response was actually quite big. It was bigger than what I'd expected. So like the news spread before I even landed in Cambridge. So the unit, the department I work in, they were really, really happy. And the college, which I'm part of, like University of Cambridge has like a bunch of college. So it's a collegiate university. So the college like got, heard the news, and they wanted to run an article about it. And the funding agency, which funds my PhD, they were also really, really impressed. And they also like ran an article on their website. So th I did not expect that level of response. But it was very encouraging. It was very inspiring. It, it motivated me to be better and like do some good science out there. So yeah, it, and it is all possible only because of the Mind Science Foundation. So I'm really, really grateful and humble to be here again. And it's amazing. <laughs> And one thing that I've learned through getting to know young scientists is that it really is a journey. Uh, you, we gave her a giant check last year, a literal giant check. <laughs> and, and what you might think is that she went right back home and did an experiment, and a month later she was done. But that's not how science works. And so, Subu, can you tell us a little bit about what the last year like what progress you've been doing and what steps you're taking to proceed with the project. And then I understand that you also have some exciting work to go back to uh, at the lab. So you want to share a little bit about that process? Yes. So to give a little bit of recap about our project, so a project uh, we aim to use non-invasive brain stimulation and to see if we can help people, and we can help people to become better at controlling and regulating their painful, unwanted, traumatic memories, and mostly in the context of PTSD and also ruminative depression. So the, and there are some unique aspects of a project which, which I covered last year. So one is we are trying to measure the emotional response of people to their negative memories, and we also want to target the specific a uh, precise anatomical brain region which is responsible for controlling or which helps people to control their negative and unwanted memories. So it's the shield region in the brain which shields us from painful and like n negative and harmful memories from the past, from un un negative thoughts from the past. And so in order to like achieve these objectives, we had to go through like a whole process of like setting up the experiment. So first we wanted to measure emotion in, the, in a different way. So we wanted to see bodily responses of emotion, to see how our body reacts when we remember something traumatic. And so we wanted to set that, set that up. So that is called psychophysiological measurements. So we are measuring the skin conductance. We are measuring the heart rates. So we are showing people these bad memories. And then we are seeing how they react. And it's not just through their self-reports. It's also through how their body reacts upon uh, witnessing those harmful and traumatic memories. So we set that up, and we also had a collaboration, which was really good, which was helpful for us. So and we have like published work on that. So that was good. And we also then wanted to like be sure that we are targeting the right region in the brain. So we analyzed a bunch of data from previous studies. So I was like, and we used like a lot of cool cutting edge techniques like DTI and DCM. So which is which are like a lot of jargon, but yeah, it's all like new techniques to like see how we can functionally and anatomically map out that precise region in the brain and so that we target it efficiently. And we also have the new TMS machine, the non-invasive technique that I talked about, that is the TMS 
that the technique is called TMS and the, we have the machine now. It's all new and shiny and bright and sitting in the department. And I've been having a lot of fun like <laughs> with the machine and I've been stimulating people back in the right. But yeah, <laughs> in, in, with it, <laughs> but with like proper <laughs> measures, like yeah, and with good ethical approval, of course. But <laughs> it's <laughs> it's still been a lot of fun. And so we are in the midst of data collection now. So I'm yeah, and we also have very promising results from our pilot studies so the, we have like good results from our unstimulated group so now we are going to like we are in the midst of stimulating people and we're collecting data and we are going to look at how that differs from our unstimulated group and if if it is going in the direction that we expect then bam we've hit the right region so that is that would be really really exciting and then we'll try to entrain that region and th that would make uh, people better at controlling their negative thoughts so yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. So you can see science is fun, science is exciting, and wonderful young minds like Subu are out there at the forefront. And so we have an announcement to make. So Subu, if you want to come here, we're going to do it old school, kind of like the Academy Awards. We have the winner here. So I will say also, before we proceed, that again, each one of these competitors has already won a $15,000 award. And so, absolutely. And so we are thrilled to have each one of them here. But of course, there is one that actually came out a little bit ahead or, and we're ready to announce that. Shall I? Would you like to? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Would you like me to? We could do it maybe at one, two, three. Count. Okay, yeah. one, <laughs> two, three, ten, ten win. win. <laughs> ten, would you please join us? Okay. <laughs> okay, and I, I also want to invite Mike Greenberg and Vincent Tachereau du Michel. Please congratulate them. Thank you so much. And in keeping with tradition, Tin will come back and visit us next year for Brainstorm 2020. We are so thrilled and excited for all three of you, and we look forward to following you for years to come. And I want to go ahead. We're going to do it wedding style. We're going to take some pictures after I dismiss you. <laughs> if you'd like to talk with the bride and groom. Just kidding. Um, but, so I, but I really do thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight and for supporting the foundation. The reason we're able to do this and this <laughs> is because of you. And we are just deeply grateful. So I hope you go and enjoy your evening. And we'll see you back here in a month for our next lecture on the neuroscience of friendship. Thank you. Thank you.